Watch this. The chicanes on Kootenai have been up for a bit, much to the chagrin of some drivers. But there's a reason they're there. And today, we catch up with one of them. You might want to call Avril Lavigne because there's going to be a lot more skater boys in Boise now that a new skate park has opened up, at least on the south side of town. Joe Paris dusted off his board to give us a sneak peek. Remember that freak thunderstorm last month that flooded several businesses in downtown Boise, including one called Artisans for Hope, which means we had to wait to find out what they actually do. Today, we find out. I feel so bad for the family. I feel so bad for the woman that was behind the wheel. I just feel like there's a lot of lives that change today, and I'm just so praying for them. I just feel so bad for them. It was nearly eight years ago when a driver hit and nearly killed Max Wyatt while he was riding his bike on the Boise bench. The Depot Bench Neighborhood Association says they've been pestering ACHD since that day to make their streets safer. And one of the ways they've done that is what we first showed you a couple months ago. A rather controversial design choice called chicanes. Concrete barriers which force traffic to bottleneck or zigzag past each other. To do that, drivers ideally slow way down in order to pass through these chicanes. So we stopped by when they were installing them on Kootenai Street, and today ACHD officially unveiled them to the public, including those who've been there from the beginning. Here's Andrew Bartline. It's a long, winding road to get here, which some say is the point. We're really pleased with um, how it's looking right now. This neighborhood road's looking a whole lot different. And these chicanes. Due to a new addition most have never heard of. Absolutely not. Not even Max Wyatt. Pretty new. New enough for a couple dozen to celebrate after years and years of asking for change. Now it's designed better for all types of uses. Jim Pickett spent 20 years on the local neighborhood association, and these chicanes are personal. No, it's a 25 mile per hour road, and you know, there's people walking here, people going across the street, kids use it to walk to school. Kids. The emotional scars are still, still a little bit on the edge. Including Max. I was five. Here on Kootenai, his life changed forever. Yeah. We uh, bike up to the Kootenai intersection. Then this van comes out of nowhere and hits me. Ended up spending three months in the hospital. My chest was quickly malformed and third degree burns started uh, um, taking shape all over my body. I broke my leg and a couple of ribs. Eight years ago. It shouldn't have taken this to do it. They started on a winding path, resulting in a solution of the same. We had over 75% of the resident owners along Kootenai sign that petition saying they needed traffic calming. The other 25% will give it to you straight. They started a petition to have them removed. Holly Huffman? Yeah, no one likes it. She's one of them. It may work. I don't know. I don't think so. It seems like a huge waste for our tax dollars, though. Because she says you can't reinvent the wheel or in this case, it's obstacles. Instead of doing the speed bumps, they decided to do this, and all we've seen are almost accidents. Marked by tracks whiffing the wind. The lanes are not wide enough for two vehicles to pass. Two small vehicles, definitely, but when you have a bus and a car trying to go, there's, they can't. So basically, it either becomes a game of chicken. Which pays no favors to the impatient. And I think that demonstrates that we needed those chicanes in there, right? It's forcing folks to pay attention and slow down. It's a few tight turns today made by those who know the whole story. I think they help a lot. Who stay focused on what's straight ahead. People can feel safe. They can ride their bike down these streets and they can have a sense of safety here. ACHD says this chicane design is better than speed bumps for emergency vehicles. Additionally, snow plows can work around the chicanes too. Those were two concerns we heard from people who oppose the design. This project started behind a five year plan that was spearheaded and petitioned by that neighborhood association. And for those who are against it, Brian, we talked with you know representatives of that neighborhood association, and they tell us that it's kind of like roundabouts. When yep. you first put them in, mm -hmm. everyone's going to lose their mind over right. it. How do I do it? What do I do? Well, eventually, if you commute through it every day, it's 
you don't even think about it. It's just day-to-day -day life. Well, just watching the video that you shot today out there, you can see that it does serve its purpose. It forces drivers to slow down, pay attention, because you saw them bumping up on the curb, crossing yeah. the double yellow, because like they're angry having to divert around. It's crazy, but it, it shows that it works. I was at a stoplight shooting video. One lady pulled up to me and she said, I feel like I'm on a racetrack. It makes me want to go faster. And really? I said, that's the opposite of what it's that for. That is the opposite. And then she shrugged, and I, I think she had like a personal vendetta against it. But, True. Uh, I thought that was humorous, but yes, ideally, slow down, don't hit the curb, stay safe. And kids like Max hopefully don't get hit. Totally. And if you don't feel like you can make it through with another car, then just wait your turn. The game of chicken. That's exactly. what they brought up. Exactly. All right. Thanks, Andrew. You know, a place where curbs and chicanery are commonplace, the skate park. And there's a new one, a new place to shred in the city of trees, one which came together rather quickly because, well, it needed to. Joe Paris drops in on the Molinar skate park. Whether you know it or not, Boise is a skate town. Any given day in, in uh, roads of downtown, we'll see 50, 60, 70 skaters. Um, I'm not sure why they're not in school when it's a school day. As the director of Boise Parks and Rec, Doug Holloway has watched the skate community grow. It's easy to track seminal moments in that. X Games in Boise was a huge part of it. We had skaters from all over the world, the, the top skaters from around the world. It was an invite-only uh, type of event, so you had to be invited by ESPN in order to come to Boise, Idaho to skate in those events. To be a skate down, you need skate parks. And like the rest of Boise, yeah, it's about growth. Brings us here, Molinar Skate Park. I would look at this park here, uh, skate park at Molinar, as being a mini roads. It really is. It has some of the same features. It has the same uh, type of layout from the standpoint that it is for beginners all the way through experts. Truth be told, without the JA and Katherine Albertson's family foundation, this park wouldn't be ready to celebrate for several more years. They work closely with the Boise Skateboard Association and the city of Boise to say, why don't we build this park sooner than when the city could build it. Uh, we were we were way on board. And speaking of being on board, new parks need new skaters. 15 year old Noah Thomas has been shredding through the city of trees since he was a young kid. I just fell in love. It was super fun. Noah Thomas ripped through the new park as the city counts down to the grand opening celebration. I love the skate park. I think it has a bunch of stuff, a bunch of area bunch of features. It's like a mini roads, like he said. It's great. I think it really flows nice. There's a bunch of space in between features and a bunch of variety from beginner to expert. So to highlight the accessibility of the park, Holloway lined up Noah to give us some skating lessons. And I think you're going to try it out. I'm going to try something into it. out. Yeah, what do you mean something? I, I, <laughs> I don't know. You brought your board. I got the board. And you've got, you've got your helmet. I've got a helmet. I'll replace the hat. Noah refresh the basics, like just moving around. Back in the pocket. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Off to a hot start. Learning to fall is a good step, though. Back on board, though. There you go. And this bank. Oh. Of course, skating's big on tricks, so let's trick it out. Ollie time. There you go. Not bad. Yeah. Got a lot of air. Final test for day one of skate school, going coast to coast. Lean forward, foots on the bolts, strong stance. That's activity, and that's physical activity, and we really want to see that with our families. It's healthy. It builds community in the city of Boise. And to cap off the day, Noah showed what skaters can really do at this park. You go fast, like manuals, flow, and long grinds here, I feel like. It feels like I'm just gliding. It's so fun flowing through the park, trying out new stuff. It's crazy that they're doing this for the skate community and they're just making new skate parks, new spots. It's crazy to me. 
So August 1st, 2023 at 930 AM. That is the official grand opening event for the Molnar Skate Park. They'll have live music from DJ Rakim, coffee from Push and Pour and a lot more. And actually that same evening, the uh, Boise Skateboard Association and some special guests, they're going to have a special Boise premiere of the brand new skate movie End Men, which is the untold story at the Egyptian Theater in downtown Boise. Big day of skating. Ryan, there's only one way, I think, to come back to the desk, and that is to, of course, skate. Noah taught me really well. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Yes, Live here. studio audience. Uh, anyways, Tony Alva is going to be there on yeah. Tuesday morning and at screening. And if you don't know who Tony Alva is, he was part of an amazing group that really innovated skating in the 1970s. I know, Brian, you're a big skater back in the 70s. And eh, not that far away, but a little decade later, maybe. Anyways, but anyway. with Tony Alva, he's one of the all-time greats. Just, and he'll be here. Do you, you like should, this? No, you should probably just spend a little more time on that, though. You look like you need a little more practice. Oh, I do. I'm not good at this. You're, you're not. I know earlier you're <laughs> like, Joe, that looked terrible. You own that, huh? Yeah, I own that. It's my board, man. Well, you look good at least standing here. Thank so you. That's good. I get a Thanks, practice. Joe. I'm more of a street skater. I'll do some tricks in the lot, yeah. Brian. Did you want these? I know Brian was asking for these all day. He said, I really want to wear them. I'm good. No, I'm good. You, they, they're better for you. All right. Thanks, well. Joe. Got good insurance. That's, that's a good that's deal. Good. We do too. have good insurance. Anyways, Brian, I hope so. I got to hit to the park. See you later. See you, Joe. <laughs> Boise has a boisterous refugee population, and one nonprofit is giving them an opportunity to connect, learn a skill, and earn some cash. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we learn from you? Just text us your thoughts, your ideas, questions, maybe your complaints. Just text the number on your screen to 208-321-5614. Always include your name and the hashtag the 208. That way it, we know it's for us and we can share it at the end of the show. On June 6th, about seven weeks ago, a strong freak thunderstorm rolled through Boise. You remember that one, right? It tore down trees, knocked out power to thousands, and dropped nearly two inches of rain in some parts of downtown, as you can see by this video. Drivers driving through it, flooding some businesses, a lot of places downtown. Businesses, homes were flooded in the downtown area. And one of those places was a small nonprofit located on 15th Street in the North End. Located in a basement, which wasn't a good spot for a flood, the nonprofit Artisans for Hope had to shut down for a few weeks to clean up the mud and dry out and replace the floors, which were ruined that night. Bit of a setback for the refugees they helped bring in a small income. Maybe you're not familiar with Artisans for Hope. Well, neither were we at that time, so we went back to find out what they're all about. We sell purses. We sell beautiful jackets like this one. This is actually a picnic blanket. This is an apron, pretty sweaters. Yeah, these are the woolen mittens. And these are the women who make them. This was part of a blanket probably, and we'll make it into these mittens. Every week. Fun. More than a handful of refugees assemble in this North Boise basement to craft donated fabric into a refurbished 
future. That looks good. They call themselves Artisans for Hope, and their mission is manifested in four words. Hi, everybody. Connect. Hi, Zia. Learn. And remember, three-eighths inch seam. Create. And earn. Cheryl is one of the many volunteers who help in the creation. I just like the um, opportunity to help other people. Something she's done since 2014. You know, you meet new people all the time. It's also a chance for Cheryl to learn their languages? No, unfortunately, and I should be. Well, it would be a lot to put together. We have a lot of different languages. Arabic, Bhutanese, Nepalese, <laughs> yeah. French. French. Farsi, yeah. They come from different places with different skills some with more than others, like Veronique, who back in her native Democratic Republic of the Congo, owned her own clothing company. I go to school, sewing school. Within a week of moving to Boise, she was connected with Artisans for Hope, and she's been coming back Ooh, since. 12 years, uh, yeah, 11, yeah, I'm here 11 years. Now, she's one of the only two part-time employees. Yeah, I cheat here. I cheat everybody. I come in here and the uh, refugee talk, 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 talk. It's beautiful for me. The talking part is one of the important parts, being shown how to sew while also expanding their exposure to English. The shoulder <laughs> and then their shelter. <laughs> yeah, kind of the same, not. The and classes last ride. three hours, but what yeah. they you take away the they lasts a lot longer. Connection, healthy connections. This is a real place where you're not just saying hi to somebody, you're actually getting to know people. Because there's, there's being in your apartment and just knowing the people around your apartment, and that's good, but getting to know people in the wider world, you know, is really valuable. But no, it's, just, it's just fun, you know. It's meaningful fun. The nonprofit is also about turning a profit for their artists. They get to keep part of the proceeds of everything they sell in their gift shop. And a few, like Camila, can turn it into something else, like a job, yeah, where she's also learning. And now Spanish. Another language. Muy bien. Muy bien is I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is a reflection of the intention of artisans for hope. I don't know, just hope, hope for connection, hope for making some money, the combination of working together creates hope. Those handcrafted bags, aprons, jackets, kid clothing, mittens, they can all be purchased at the Artisans for Hope gift shop on 15th Street. Again, located in the basement on the corner of Hayes and 15th. And they will gladly accept any donation to their cause, whether it be cash, or fabrics, buttons, threads, even sewing machines, because every graduate of their level one class gets a working donated sewing machine to take home.
Quite a picture there from Idaho weather watchers. Now, to begin with here, I just want to tell you the temperatures, we're getting closer to that time where the average temperatures start to fall downhill. This is how close we're at. Uh, for today, uh, this is the highest at 95 degrees. That's the highest average temperature, which is in the month of July. Coming August the 2nd, which is just the middle of next week, okay, just a little less than a week, the temperature starts falling. It's at 94. That's the average temperature, okay, when we average all the temperatures up. And so then when we get to about the 15th, the average temperature is 91. So there's a real slow trend for temperatures dropping just about the middle part of August. And then when we get to the end of August, it starts dropping a little bit quicker. The average at that time is 86 degrees. So there we are, just about another month, or at least in the next three weeks or so, we should be seeing some differences. So just showing you how we play with some of these numbers. Uh, right now at 95, you see it's possible to have a temperature over 100, maybe even as much as 10 degrees, which would be extreme. Uh, we could even have a few degrees below it, which we've had temperatures around 91. So if you look at it here, extreme would, toward the end of the month would be maybe a 95, and then lower could be maybe even somewhere into the lower 80s. So it's a big change that's taking place in the next three to four weeks. As you look here with Live Storm Tracker 7000, we have a uh, watch for fires over here in Eastern Oregon, and then a red flag warning. Now this is just the next step up from a watch, which means that the potential for fires are pretty good because of the low humidity as well as the higher temperatures. So they're watching that real quickly along through here. Hopefully uh, it's not the same for over here in Eastern Oregon, but it's a possibility that that could be updated to a red flag warning. All of Southern Idaho has it. As you can see, there are a few showers that are over here just to the east side of the state, but it really doesn't amount to much. But something good as long as, and I've got to say this, as long as we don't see any other fires building nearby, this is what will happen. Most of the smoke that we're seeing now is coming up from the west southwest from some of those fires in southern Oregon. Of course, we have some local fires as well. So as we continue with this and we run this, we see some light fires through late Friday night. That is light smoke, I should say. And then it clears out as long as everything basically stays the same. So the seven day forecast has temperatures in the 90s near 100, you guys, up to the first part of next week. And then after that, high temperatures will be the low to the mid 90s. You know, the Basque culture has been woven into the fabric of Boise since, well, pretty much the beginning. A group of Basques rolled into the Boise Valley with hopes of cashing in on the gold and silver boom of the late 1800s. But that was quickly sidetracked into sheep herding, and many more kept coming from northern Spain. Before too long, Idaho could claim the highest concentration of Basque people outside of the Basque country. What other place can say they have a Basque block, by the way? Boise does. And every year on that block, on the last weekend in July, they hold the Basque Festival, which is actually called the San Ignacio Festival. And this weekend, the Boise Basque block will be filled with live music, dancing, sports, a lot of good food, and of course, some drinks that you want to try that, well, Basque or otherwise. It's called the San Ignacio Festival because it's St. Ignatius is the patron saint of the Basque people. Isana Bengochea is a board member for the is called the knock board and she says this is the time to let the Basque culture shine in Boise. It's a way to keep our culture alive here in the area um, but more than that like if you were on a basketball team that always practiced and you never had a game how long are you going to go to practice for right so it's kind of cool to have these big events where you get to show off and all of your hard work kind of pays off. And it's really cool to be a part of she's talking about by the way the dancers those are the athletes she's talking about who practice all year long and then they get to showcase their skills on the street this weekend. You'll get to see them in tip top shape throughout the weekend starting tomorrow night goes all the way through Sunday night. Best part it is free and open to everyone food and drinks you got to pay for but everything else is there for you to see and enjoy. You can find a link to the list of events. It's on our website at KTVB.com and every five years there's an even bigger festival called Hialdi which was canceled in 2020 because of COVID, but is expected to be back in 2025. So get ready for that. The weekend one, just kind of a warm up to 2025.
Anytime something new comes to town, people obviously, well, blame California for it, like Joe Ford did today. This chicane idea is another California shenanigan. He says, Idaho four-wheel drive trucks go right over them. Actually, it was 1930s in the UK where they began, and you wouldn't, wouldn't you know it, this isn't even the first one in Boise. There's already another chicane in town. So, uh, this is, uh, but, oh, Joe, you can't rock Nike socks with Vance. Come on, bro. He's not a skater. Is that clear to everybody? So he doesn't know kind of how that works. This one's my favorite. Joe, you get my vote for just getting on a skateboard. Your time in life. Old Joe. Thanks, Phyllis.